to the Extraordinary Friends Show. I'm Brian Balestri, and I'm really excited about tonight's episode. I've got two great friends here tonight, and for, uh, for them, they haven't really met each other, so this is going to be a lot of fun <clears throat> having them get to know each other and hear their great stories. Let me start off with my good friend Norris, who's going to be co-host. Norris, how are you? I'm doing well, Brian. Thank you for the invite. You're, I'm glad you're here. Uh, <laughs> Norris, I've known for about 30 years. I was thinking about that on yep. the way here. Yep. Technically, I know you through my brother, mm -hmm. so I am one removed from our friendship, right? Isn't that kind of how it works? Yes. <laughs> okay. So you have a lot in common with, with Roman, and that's part of why I asked you to be the co-host tonight. Because uh, we both bear hunt? Yes, because you both bear hunt. No, you don't bear hunt, do you? No, I do not. Okay, yes. Pre-show discussion okay. coming out during the show. Okay. Perfect start to this episode. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Roman now. Roman, I've known you for about three years. We met, first of all, thanks for coming. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you could make it, and I'm uh, excited about getting into your background and hearing all your stories. But I've known you for about three years, right? Yeah, something like that. We, uh, we, we met each other um, at work. I was doing some work at a client, and Roman was one of my bosses there. And we'll get into some of the fun that we had, quotes around fun, <laughs> that we had working together. Um, so, <clears throat> as usual, this is a, is a group effort. So, Norris, jump in whenever <clears throat> you have a question or you want to correct anything. But f starting from the very top, or I should say the very beginning, Roman, I want to know... Uh, about your upbringing because I've known you for a few years now but I've never really known where you came from if I remember right and I remember you telling me it was either Venice Beach or the Hamptons right was it one of those two mm, Nantucket, Nantucket. <laughs> Nantucket. I, I spent a lot of time in the Hamptons that's but right. it was really Nantucket seriously I'm, I'm obviously being facetious to at least the two of us that know that <laughs> right. where did you start out I was born in Minneapolis Okay, that's completely <laughs> different than where I thought you were born. Right, right. All right. I was born in Minneapolis, downtown uh, General Hospital, right downtown. All right, Still we can speed there. it up a little bit. Where mm -hmm. did you grow up? Uh, so I lived in Minneapolis for the first, I think, six years okay. of my life. I went to kindergarten in northeast Minneapolis, and then uh, right after uh, kindergarten, we relocated to northern Minnesota, and I spent most of first grade in northern Minnesota. Okay. And Where in nor northern Minnesota? Big Fork. Okay. So I lived just south of Big Fork, went to school in Big Fork, Minnesota. So let me just back up and explain to the, the listeners and the viewers and to Norris. I have known uh, Roman for these several years, mm -hmm. and I have always gotten <laughs> grief because I live in Minneapolis. And Romans always explain that you are a, what, 218er? 218er, sure. 218er, which apparently means... An up north guy. Way up north. Way up north, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And Ranger I, even, right? North of the range, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's always been kind of an attitude looking down on us Minneapolis folks. And it turns out you were born in Minneapolis. I you was. never mentioned that before. I, I, I was born in Minneapolis. So he was a 6-1 tour. If That's he correct. started out but a 6-1 But he believes tour. in the 218. Yeah. 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 Okay. By spirit, mm -hmm. I am 218. So do you... Even so, have you lived more in six one two or two one eight? Six one two being the whole Twin Cities. Well, at this point, it would be in the Twin Cities because I've been here, you know, twenty years, roughly over twenty years, uh, right around there. But the formative years were in northern Minnesota. Northern Minnesota. Eh, for the most part, there was a stint there uh, where I lived uh, north of the Twin Cities. Okay. In Isani for a few years, but it was rural, I'd say similar experience mm -hmm. as northern Minnesota at the time when you think about the early 80s back then. So so this is a great part about this uh, this whole thing is because I thought I knew you and I thought you were like small town guy from the get-go and that you kind of looked down mm -hmm. on us uh, Twin Cityans, <laughs> if that's such a term. Uh, it's actually city <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one. That's good. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ex so, point in case. Right. Case in point. Uh, City five. Matter. Yeah. <laughs> and it turns out you spent the majority of your life in the Twin Cities. So, do you consider yourself My a big life. city person? No. Or? Okay. So, you are a small town, born and bred, but not, not born. born. Not born <laughs> or not bred. Not or bred. No. Born and bred, but not born. Just my formative years. 
What, okay, so, so what are, what is that range from six to? Oh well, uh, like I said, I spent um, you know part of first grade, most of first grade in Big Fork, and then uh, moved to the Isani area and lived there the last couple months of first grade through sixth grade. Okay. And then moved back to Big Fork, but I had spent time going there okay. over those years. Um, so you consider yourself. Uh, it would it be Big Forkian or a Big F -E. Forker? An F -E. F -E. Uh I'm definitely from F-E. You're going to have to tell me how to spell that exactly. E-F-F-I-E. Uh, F-E. Yeah. All right. So uh, when you were in F-E, mm -hmm. right, what was, what was life like? What, did you have pets? What did, did you have uh, a bunch of friends? Did you have guns? I did. So there, um, it was 1984, I think, when I moved back to F-E. Okay. Uh, lived outside of town a couple miles uh, on a fur farm, mm -hmm. actually, and uh, took care of silver fox and ferrets. And out there... Can you back up a second? Did you say you lived on a fur farm? I did, yeah. So Did, mm -hmm. did they know you were living on their fur farm? <laughs> no. <or>? no. <laughs> but the, so the food was good. So <laughs> the, <laughs> who, how did you live on a fur farm? Was the people, it the family fur the farm? The people who owned the fur farm had uh, another house on their property that they rented out. Oh, I so see. So when we moved okay. there, we rented that house, okay. which happened to sit uh, between the barns that had the ferrets and the, and the silver fox. So it was like an out... An outhouse? Not, not no, an outhouse, no, but no, it was just... Nothing like an outhouse. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> it was a trailer house. Okay. Uh, located, you know, away from their house. Mm -hmm. They had a big log house and then they had a, a trailer house, okay. uh, out, say, in the backyard, but it, it was a lot of acreage, so it isn't really a backyard, but... So did you have a lot of friends? I mean, were, were people around that you could hang out with, or was it you? There, the... there was nobody. It was just uh, me and uh, my mom. Uh, lived there, uh, just the two of us, mm -hmm. and the people who owned the fur farm. Okay. So uh, it was two miles outside of town, not terribly far, and lived there, I think, the first probably uh, nine months, ten months, uh, and then moved into town. And so how big is town? How big at is At that Effie? time, Effie uh, was probably um, 50, 50 people. I think the 1990 wow. census had, had it at 58. Wow. wow. That's that's pretty small. It is pretty small, yeah. So you knew everybody. Absolutely, yeah. You knew everybody in town. Was that fun to live in a small town? Was it fun to grow up in a small town? It seems like it would be different between being an adult in a small town and being a kid. Yeah, in a small you know, it's really interesting because uh, growing up there, it was great. Uh, there was five of us guys, all pretty much the same age, mm -hmm. who lived right in town. Uh, we hung out all, all the time, did a lot of stuff together. Uh, you, you know, we got into a lot of things, went three wheeling, hunting, and building forts, and mm -hmm. you know all of those those things. And then I think you get to a certain point where you you either stay or you leave, mm -hmm. right? I think if people don't leave there sometime by their early twenties, they don't ever leave. Like they miss their window. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. there's a window there, and it, uh, you get really comfortable and outside of their. Uh, you begin to develop, a, I think, a lifestyle or habits that doesn't quite work. So I had, I think, a unique uh, experience where I was born in the city and I would travel and visit my grandparents and other family there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I left there, I left in the military, I didn't have the option of just saying, oh, I'm going to go home now. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're forced to leave for a while. Uh, and I went back and forth quite a bit. And then I think since... Uh, returning from the military, uh, my family still lives there. A lot of my good friends live there, so I go back quite a bit. Okay. But I live with a, a leg in, in both worlds. Hmm. Uh, so does that, well, so let's get to this uh, childhood first. So did you go to high school there? Mm-hmm. And did, did Effie have a high school? Effie or did you didn't. There was, uh, there was some community schools in the area where you got further out of town where they had elementary schools uh, up until or through sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And then everybody went seventh through twelfth grade in the Big Fork High School. Seven through twelve, okay. Seven through Big 12. Fork had high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Big Fork was seven miles, mm -hmm. is seven miles from Effie. Okay. They also had an elementary school, so the people were close to that area, went to elementary school, kindergarten through third grade in Big Fork. 
fourth, fifth, and sixth grade in Effie. There was a small school in Effie. So everybody mm -hmm. who went fourth, fifth, and sixth grade went to Effie. Mm -hmm. And then you went back to Big Fork. For high school. For high school. So in high school, were you, what, what, what group were you in? Were you in the jocks? Were you in the band, nerds, burnouts? Just, it, did they even have groups up there? I, I have not from they, a small town. Obviously, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm picking that up. I think yes. we, we, well, I mean, right, I'm not. The, there, you know, there's groups um, just like any, uh, I think, school or, or social circle, I think you'd find, but that there, it's maybe slightly different uh, because you would have people who, there's a lot of crossover between groups. It's not big enough. It, it, when I was in high school, 7th grade through 12th grade, there was 112 students. For five grades? For five grades. Wow. So what was your graduating class? 28. And you were top 10, maybe? I, w I was in the... I was in the Upper top half? 15 <laughs> of my <laughs> class, right? Nice. Which is, no, I, I always lead with that because it's a great accomplishment. Was. I was not top 20 in right. my class, yeah. even yeah. close. Uh, yeah, I'll remind people of that. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. So you mentioned that you went into the military. Was that right yeah. out of high school then? Yes. And what, what uh, branch of Air Force. Really? Yeah. And did you do that for an opportunity? Or did you have a big desire, somebody in the family? You know, as long as I can remember, I wanted to serve in the military. Okay. So it was uh, just a matter of figuring out which branch okay. I, I was going to go in. And How'd you pick the Air Force then? Uh, I think I talked to a few people. I was leading uh, with Marines. That was my, they seemed like, in my mind, the most admired. You know, the, the, the hardest, the strongest, the toughest. Mm -hmm. uh, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. Seriously, yeah. I was just trolling no. you. The, the, they, they, um, they endure quite a bit. Really, right? that's a you. You have really accomplished something if if you can call yourself a marine. So, the. But Air Force is not a walk in the park either, right? No, it, it isn't. There, there's each branch does something different, right? They serve mm -hmm. a different purpose, etc. There's a lot of joking. You know, between the branches, and then you'll find service people will give each other a lot of grief and crap about wh which branch they served in, the shortcomings, and the stereotypes of them. I always just say that, say like the Army, um, they, they serve a very uh, necessary role, uh, a, a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. uh, tough people that have done amazing things for our country in that branch. Uh, but I, I like to remind them that they they got paid from the neck down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, you get paid from the neck okay, down, right? Yeah, the, yeah. So, so it's a little bit different. It isn't well, as physically you, as strenuous. What did you do? Civil engineering. Oh. So I was uh, I fell in the 55th Civil Engineering Squadron, and I did uh, a Wait, lot. Wait, so did you pursue that? line of work? I don't know how the military works exactly. They, I don't know anything. They you give the you an aptitude test and find <laughs> out where where you're best fit. Are you a bus driver? Are you a cook? Are you a pilot? Mm -hmm. you know, one of the pilots don't get in the aptitude test, but you may be working on planes, an A&P mechanic, you know, things like that. Okay. And then they send you to, based on where you test, you they say these career fields need this kind of a score. Mm -hmm. And then they say, where do we need people? And what is your score? And they plug you in where they need you where you're most likely to be successful based on your test results. So, so we, no, go ahead. a civil engineer in the Army does something completely different than a civil engineer I, in the Air Force. I would imagine. And there was a lot of things that happened in our squadron. Uh, it could be from people who were working in power plants to water treatment facilities okay. to designing uh, on-base housing. I worked in, um, say, the heating and air conditioning refrigeration space okay. uh, with fuel systems so it was a lot of boilers um, we, we made clean air for you know really important buildings that became isolated in national attacks etc I worked in the building where they store the president's plane really mm -hmm. Air Force no. One yeah it's called the E4B kneecap which was at the time which is a airborne national emergency command post Wow. Air Force One seems shorter and faster. <laughs> it's only Air Force One when the president's on it. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. And it, say the helicopter <laughs> is Marine One, so they fly so them. So the uh, Marines take care of that one then? They, they, mm -hmm. they fly the helicopter. Ah. So. Interesting. Um, so the military, you know, you had a good experience? I had a great experience, yeah. You highly recommend it for 
kids or young men I, and women? I do. It, it, uh, I think it's it's maybe not for everybody, mm -hmm. uh, but I think everybody should have that experience. I, there was nothing there that um, would preclude you from serving in the military, and I think it gives you a different perspective, gives you some time to uh, learn some skills. Uh, I think most of the skills I learned about uh, teamwork and making things happen, doing things with quality, th th those were all ingrained, I think, during my time in the military. Hmm. So, <clears throat> anything, any crazy stories from the military? I mean, it seems like they either, not necessarily you, but you can welcome mm -hmm. to tell that. I mean, it seems like the military tends to have you do things that you think, this is the dumbest thing ever. Did that ever, you ever anything like that? Yeah, there's all kinds of stories like that. The, I don't even know if I could pick one, but <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, in, the, in the beginning, hurry up and wait. So uh, it, it, say basic training, most people associate it with uh, the physical fitness aspect. You're mm -hmm. gonna go to basic training. And really, it's onboarding for the military. Okay. Uh, they they keep you busy with the physical aspects of it uh, they get you into shape if you're not into shape but really it's about establishing your military records teaching you military law military justice customs and courtesies who to salute how to salute when to salute uh, getting your dental records getting any shots that you know they do all kinds of things to get you prepared to be a good soldier mm -hmm. during that period of time and then send you off to whatever training uh, you get from there so you end up doing a lot of stuff where uh, you know that they, you're going to run across base to get to a different location and then you stand there for an hour <laughs> and you think well, why did we run what was the <laughs> hurry <laughs> right. Right. we could have just walked but you know they're, they're covering different things getting right. you in shape yeah. and uh, teach you different uh, points of discipline. I remember one time we're standing out on this drill pad, which is like a giant parking lot, mm -hmm. asphalt parking lot, to Texas in July, August. That's where you were stationed? Yeah, San Antonio, Texas, mm -hmm. Lackland Air Force Base. And you're on an Air Force Base, so there's a lot of planes flying around. And we're standing in formation. We ran down somewhere. We got there. You're standing there. It's hot. You're wearing dark green BDUs, battle dress uniform, okay. you know, camouflage, combat boots, a hat and you're on this giant asphalt parking lot in the Texas sun in, in August, it's pretty hot. Uh, and you're waiting for you know, 20, 30 minutes. Maybe you're going in to get uh, your haircut for on day 15, you get a second haircut. So, and there maybe there's uh, five, six, seven flights ahead of you of 50 people each. So you're just waiting your turn. Mm -hmm. And you're standing there uh, at attention or maybe at parade rest and somebody looked up uh, at a plane uh, that flew over and our drill instructor saw that because you see 50 people all standing at parade rest or at attention and then mm -hmm. one person oh, he does moves this. his head. Yeah, oh. you, you, you stand out. You get okay. a really loud plane or something different. Sometimes you're daydreaming and you just look. Yep. And uh, made all of us stand there with our heads cranked to the sky and count the planes <laughs> and we all had to have the same number you know <laughs> by the time we got done so you you learn a different aspect of performing as a team and and uh, thinking about how you yeah. your decision can impact the people yeah. around you and so how long does it take for you to figure that out when you're there that everybody says hey this is all about teamwork and discipline in the beginning, you have all the questions. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? When do you stop saying, why are we doing it? And just it happens. realize it's all, we know what it's all about. Right, it happens relatively quick because uh. you can't do it on your own. Uh. So there, there are just things that happen. This isn't necessarily the same in the other branches, but say the, mili the Air Force, real strong attention to detail. They're driving attention to detail. Mm -hmm. And you have to organize your wall locker a certain way, you know, all your hangers evenly spaced all folded, pressed, you know, the same way, your socks and underwear folded neatly in six inch squares with all the elastic waistband. You sit there with the tweezers and get them all completely flush. Uh, and, and get so what is, what is going through your mind as you're tweezering your underwear? Like this is the greatest thing ever. I, I, I do this at <laughs> home, but I never thought I'd use a, tweezers. It's impossible. You, think, right. you know, you spend an hour and a half on, a, on one uh, pair of underwear. Yeah. And, <laughs> 
And you're thinking, what in the world? But it, it's really driving that attention to detail. And you know, if you're fortunate, one of them will say, you know, you have to pay attention to what you're doing. You have to do it perfectly because you could be working on a jet. You could be working in a hospital, saving somebody's life. There's sure. a lot of different things. You could you'd be working on nuclear armaments. You have to learn to pay attention to what you're doing and execute your job flawlessly every time. The problem is you don't have enough time to shine your boots, fold your underwear, make your bed, and there's different things that people are good at. Some people are great at shining boots, some people suck. Some people are great at beds, other people suck at beds. What was your skill? Definitely beds. You were good at beds? I can make a, a bed with hospital corners. Oh, a quarter on Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, there's a, a guy who bunked next to me and I made his bed and he did something for me. I, you're always horse training these responsibilities. So okay. the guy who's really good at boots might have 20 boots stacked up. He's just cranking them and up. And he's just shining. <laughs> and somebody else is running the buffer. Somebody else is mm -hmm. folding socks. Assembly line right. this thing. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So I made his bed every morning. His name is Todd Lundmark. And uh, every day our drill instructor would come by and tell him what a terrible job he did on his bed. Right? And I did both beds. And then he'd say, why can't you do it like Fraulein he does? <laughs> so they, they mess with you too. They find some thing Are, that they want to try to you find don't a weakness. pipe up and go say, uh, excuse me, I, I made both of them? Nope. <laughs> no, you just, just, go along. just keep your mouth shut because there's nothing good that can come from that. Right. Only more work. Yep. So from day one, they're driving you towards that teamwork. They know <coughs> when they're doing it right is when everybody starts pitching in and you're good at this and you're going to everybody get something that I, they're good I would, at. No, I've never been a drill instructor, but I have to imagine you begin to see it come together. Yeah. Sure. Right. You yep. see mm -hmm. people figuring this out mm -hmm. and understanding the value of it, and uh, you see the overall performance of the team uh, come together. Mm -hmm. So, what what Norris doesn't know, but I know because I work for you. There's is a lot I don't know. That there you is know. a lot you don't know. <laughs> Wait a minute. Related to this story? <laughs> Probably <laughs> about general. anything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that having worked for you, either you were you were very much like that going into the military or you took that with you coming out of the military because <laughs> I would create documents and it would represent everything it was supposed to represent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a mm -hmm. Visio diagram or whatever. You go, those two boxes don't line up. Or that font is not what was used in the last line. And I had struggled with that because I'm like, the concept is important. The information the is all, yes. Mm -hmm. So was that... A, just messing with me, B, something that you learned from the military and felt was important, or C, you were always kind of uh, very much, not OCD, but very attention to detail. Did you fall into the military easily, or was that hard? No, it was kind of uh, kicking and screaming. I think it was really a difficult transition. Uh, but yeah. I learned to appreciate the value of, of what they were teaching me. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and why it made sense. And I think throughout my career, I've come to appreciate even more for a variety of different reasons. So no, I was not doing it just because it was you or harassing <laughs> you. That Although there, that was a benefit. There is a benefit to that, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a large military influence in, in a lot of what I do. Okay. Uh, no doubt about it. But some of it is uh, my personal belief as well that the, m the more quality people drive into what they're doing, the, the more proud they are of that work, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the more they will um, in invest looking after it to make sure it's safeguarded and continues to stay at a high uh, level of quality. Mm -hmm. you know, if you shortcut something, you care less about it than if you put your all into it. So there's a mixture of things, but definitely uh, I, it's something I've had to manage too because there's some things that it, it, it just doesn't matter. The most important thing is to get it done mm -hmm. and out the door, right? Shipping it is more important than it being perfect and you have to find the balance. I, I think I, I continue to work on that all the time. You know, I heard this story uh, from David Lee Roth was telling about there was kind of a urban legend, at least I thought it was an urban legend, that they would, as part of their riders for setting up their um, Van Halen, setting up their, their stage and everything, they said no green M&Ms in the yeah. M&M jar, yeah. right? And so they were asking, like, what, what was the deal there? You guys, you got to understand, our, we had an, a really elaborate contract. It was like 160 pages. And in there, in the contract, right in the middle, we said no green M&Ms in the bowl in there. And the whole idea was if we came into our dressing room and there was green M&Ms, it showed they hadn't read the contract. Right. 
And apparently they had had a guy die, one of the roadies died, because mm -hmm. something wasn't set up right. Mm -hmm. So this was like one of their little quality tests. Mm -hmm. But you know, from mm -hmm. the you know, view of the outsider, like what kind of diva is this? Right. And it's more about, you know, attention to detail shows you've done the details yeah. or the due diligence throughout. Yep. Well, so you've had uh, kind of a varied career. So it's, you really started your career, I suppose, in the military in terms of getting your education. And then you've worked at a several different places. I went out on LinkedIn and checked out uh, your progression up to now your director. What is your title now? Director okay. of Technical Services. Okay, so I kind of know what you do. So we won't go into great detail of right. the work that you do. But in terms of management side, you say you've taken some of the military things that you've learned and applied it to uh, your management. So how has that served you, so to speak? Like what, what's been the good things that it's taught you and, the, and maybe not so good things that it's taught you? Uh, so the good things is really caring about what you're doing and I think keeping your commitment uh, when you make a commitment to people mm -hmm. that you follow through and you keep that, you don't take it lightly and that you deliver something of high quality. Uh, at, you know, and what I do, particularly in the operations space, it's really important for you to have solid processes, um, good infrastructure, understand what's going to happen in, in the event of a disaster before you have a disaster, mm -hmm. and make sure you're prepared and you have good plans uh, and all of those things work effectively. So paying attention to detail is, is pretty important. There's a, you know, it helps in the budgeting process and the planning process when you know that somebody's checked all the boxes and, and done all of the due, due diligence that they need to do. Uh, the f flip side of that is it can drive people a bit crazy at times, so you have to learn to manage their expectations, let them know that you're going to get to that level of detail, and it's really about, you know, 90% planning, 10% execution. That part is a little harder to do, especially uh, if you're rushed or pushed or pressured for time. Mm -hmm. You know, managing the change management aspect of anything, every corporation I think struggles <laughs> with that. Um, so you you can run into issues with that. I, I know I have. So uh, I'll explain to, to Norris here, having worked for him, uh, I have experienced the full spectrum of Roman, which is, mm -hmm. Uh, you're doing a good job to mm -hmm. you're doing a horrible job. <laughs> that's, that's the, there's and no you're doing a fantastic job. Do you get job. the same added, uh, presented mm -hmm. with the same emotion or is it a completely different? Oh no. Uh, well, uh, well so that's the thing. I mean I've worked for a lot of bosses because I'm a contractor, mm -hmm. IT contractor, so I've, I've had a lot of you know people that I report to yep. and I would say that the, the difference for working with Roman is you know exactly where you stand all the time, which is not true with most bosses. That's most military bosses, training there. And, and maybe that is, mm -hmm. I don't know. But you, he would tell you, the moment you're doing something mm -hmm. wrong, he will tell you, whether mm -hmm. you're standing there with you and him in his office in a one-on-one, -on -one, or in a group with 35 people, you're gonna find out how you're doing. So is that a military thing, or is that a, a best practice that you've picked up along the way, or? Or what do you think about I, that? You know, I don't know that all of it's a best practice. <laughs> <laughs> there, I think it's important to, to be clear with people and to be uh, transparent. How many people have you made cry at work? Uh, so there's a By lot. By gender. The, <laughs> the, there's a, there's, I never cried at work. Yeah, right. There's Not one work. person where I asked one time, you know, you'd be amazed at the questions you'll ask that somebody will start crying. So I don't know that that's a completely legitimate question. <laughs> I was interviewing one, somebody one time and I said, it looks like In you. In an interview? Yes, yes, I know. It's oh terrible. My God. But I, I was looking at her work history and she had stayed somewhere a short period of time and I said, it looks like uh, maybe you made the wrong decision here. Oh. Right when you went from this company to this company, and then you left shortly thereafter, tell me about that and what were you thinking at the time? And uh, she sat there for a minute and then just started crying. And oh, well, so that's not so. I but okay. I felt I felt bad about yeah. it. Yeah, right? but right. she really, it actually worked out really well for her. But she took it so personal that she felt like she didn't uh, hold up her end of the commitment. She went into a job thinking it was one way. It turned out to be something different and she needed to leave. But she felt bad about making that transition and, and she cried. Yeah. So at work then, when you're, let's say you're dealing with Brian. Now I don't think Brian needs to be nurtured. I've never known him to be that type of guy. But you might, right. you have, everybody's different. Right. Everybody's different. So maybe so, let me back up and just tell mm -hmm. Roman a quick 
you own a your own business, right? Yep. And uh, describe your business or explain your business real it's quick. It's basically concrete grinding and polishing. So we take concrete surfaces and put high fin end finishes on them for commercial floors and some residential, but mostly commercial. And I've, I've uh, seen properties. some. He showed me a couple of the industrial yep. places. It's really cool. You you would really appreciate That's it. stuff. The uh, uh, the thing I was going to say is that you have a lot of people reporting to you. Right? In some either people. directly in one or, way, in one way or another. Or yeah. Either or other subcontractors, subcontractors right. or people that are at the company. That yeah. you're responsible for. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, go ahead. I interrupted. So the nurture, um, how how do you I mean that that's a tough one when you're dealing with people. Where you know, you gotta figure out who needs to kick in the butt and who needs to be nurtured and are you a do you consider yourself somebody who could be a nurturing person? Um, you know, a lot of times I've got a lot of my wife He's making a face. I can see him <laughs> out of the corner of my eye making a my face. Wife, my wife is all military. Her father, uncle's friends, everybody yeah. was yeah. all military, and not very many of them are nurturing. Right. So I, I think that there's a, there's a few different ways to, to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. I, I think people at first blush or first glance wouldn't put me in the nurturing category. Mm -hmm. But really, really. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you were to look at the track record of how many people I work with and coach and mentor, mm -hmm. and the people I keep in contact with from every role that I've had throughout my career, uh, I think you would you would agree that there's they're getting value there. They're getting um, something that's valuable to them to continue that mm -hmm. relationship or continue to seek my input and feedback. It's different than, than most people because I tend to be uh, much more direct. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll have the conversation with somebody say, how do you want this? How, how do you want to have this conversation? I can deliver it any way you need me to deliver mm -hmm. it. So, uh, so a lot of times people say, just tell me what's going on. And they don't really mean that, right? Mm -hmm. But they'll say that. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of um, evaluate for yourself. I think early in my career, I would just say it. And uh, that, that was a challenge for people. And you learn to hone that message. And when, you know, Brian earlier said it didn't matter if you were one-on-one -on -one or a group of 35 people. There's definitely things that you're not going to talk to somebody about in a group of 35 people. Sure. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. and there's other things that, that you are. And hopefully you've built a team that uh, people f see that it's okay to give and get feedback. And sometimes you have to leave that example and say, when you screwed up, you own it. Hey, mm -hmm. I screwed this up. Hey, I'm sorry. This is my mistake, or I dropped the ball here. And, and encourage people to give you feedback, ask for feedback, and, and be, I think, confident or courageous enough to give feedback as well. And it's not an easy thing to do. Right. So, you know, so here's the thing. I, I used to be a supervisor of uh, assembly line and a machine shop in, earlier in my career. And I, looking back on it, I realized I was probably not a very good manager in that I did not like conflict and I didn't like having or delivering tough messages, right? So I was always trying to hedge in a way that they could redeem themselves without really getting the information. And I would say, you know, working for you, you get people to bring their A game because they're going to get punished if they're not bringing their A game. Punished? I, in the sense that they're going to know it's not good enough. You're right? held accountable and, yeah, for right, the results. Right. Punished? I don't know what. <laughs> punished. <laughs> off with your head! <laughs> oh, so you would have chopped off heads in early, like in the 1500s, if you would have been a manager in the 1500s, you would have lopped some heads off. Probably. I don't think so. Really? No, I okay. don't. Uh, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't even have capital punishment with my kids. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you've told me that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the 1500s, you would have lopped some heads off. I don't think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing I will say. So what drove... Sounds like you were obsessed with it. <laughs> <laughs> so youth, I can... You, Roman, to you, is one t as tough as you've ever... Yeah. Guy you've ever worked for. Right. So what... And this is why I said you don't need to be nurtured. And that is that the attraction? Is that here's a guy no, who's telling uh, it to you straight. Yep. Whether it's something you want to hear or you don't want to hear, you know it's always fair. Right. Yeah, no, and it's coming I, from a point of honesty, not from some backwards emotion trying to get at you or trying to make you look bad so he looks better or whatever. It's always a straightforward. Yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I respect about Roman is that he, is, I mean, you give tough messages when they need to be given. And I would say 
eighty percent of managers don't do that. Yeah. They they do everything yeah. they can, and and I think HR tends to try to help them do everything they can to never actually give the the cut and dry tough mm -hmm. message that the person needs. And when you hear a tough message, it hurts, you know, because you're not used to it in your career. Like I I think I do a good job in my job, but I, Roman was like on me, going like I need you to step it up. We had a very tough project, the the data center that we built. We had a, sh a very short timeline, and it had a lot to do. And, uh, and he pushed us all really hard, but I, I respected that it wasn't unfair, it was tough, you know? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, it made me realize how many other managers, and even looking in my own career, that I was not as probably clear with people as I should have been. I'm not from the corporate world, but you know, there, I always consider there a difference between a manager managing a project and leading a project. There's a complete mm -hmm. difference, and you can tell right away with somebody. This person's leading it. This person's just managing. They're just trying to get through, and they're figuring out how mm -hmm. they don't have, you know, a true leader yeah. works for all the qualities, you know. Yeah, I, I, and the, the thing I notice quite a bit is when <clears throat> it's easy to manage a company or a, or a group when everything's kind of copacetic and yep. doing fine. When stuff starts going bad or you have a tough timeline, mm -hmm. that's when you see whether a manager really has it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, whether they can step up and get their people to step up. And I, you know, not to butter your bread too much, but I respect the way you can do that. Um, but you know, so let's talk about uh, outside of work, right? Yeah. So, are you? Do you think your personal life is a little is similar in the way that you have the same high expectations for people outside of work as you do at work? Uh, I or do. Or more forgiving? Uh, I, I, know, I think I'm probably the same. I have the same expectations. It isn't any different where I am who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to be mindful of the situation or the audience or you know, wh what's, what's happening just, just because it doesn't, it, that tool doesn't fit all of the time. Sure. And I think I'm getting better at it the older I get, uh, the more you realize how much you don't have figured out. <laughs> and you're still working your way through all of it, yeah. but uh, I think it's it's probably somewhat similar in my personal life. I think was, you you hit on something that I, I think about quite a bit, which is the older I get, not the less that I know, but the less I feel, the more I think I question certain aspects, like should I be doing it this way, or right. you know, or what is the best way to do this, rather than when I was young, I was like this is what it is, or that's what it, you know, everything was black and white when I right. was young, and it's not. Do you, you feel the same way? And you know, I, I, uh, I was thinking about this recently. You know, I didn't, I didn't know my dad growing up. It was just my mother and I. Mm -hmm. And when I found out I was going to be a dad, it was a little frightening because I had no idea what the hell a dad did or was supposed mm -hmm. to do. And I thought in my head, I said, you know, after I thought about well, this is okay because I don't have any of the bad habits that are going to carry over into my parenting style. Sure. I can just think about all the things that I wish I had in a dad and I'll do that. Did you have any models, like either people in the community or TV shows, you know, or I, like, I, who did you? I had a couple. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> put them in the great role model category, but they were role people? models. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. not, yeah, all right. So wh what, I, what I think about it now is, uh, um, that's a really bad way to approach parenting. Uh, <laughs> How so? Uh, um, you know, I was young. I was in my early 20s, yeah. right? Your view of the world and how things should work and, you know, et cetera, is relatively uh, small and limited. So I was formulating this idea or strategy of what it was going to be like to parent and what things were really important and how should I uh, go about this. And what I thought at the time uh, isn't what I think today. Sure. And it isn't what I know to be true today. And the, the unfortunate part about parenting is when you're doing it, you're learning the right. first time. Yeah, so, right, right. It, you know, yep. you're, you only have one first kid, mm -hmm. and then the, you only have one second kid. So each one you're mm -hmm. learning different things. You're mm -hmm. learning on the job. And that's not necessarily the environment where you're going to drive a great quality experience. <laughs> right. Right? Right. Where you're learning on They're the job. They're basically prototypes. Right? So, and it's <laughs> unfortunate because the, the decisions you make and the impacts that you have are lifelong and lasting. Yes. Right. right. And you can't necessarily undo them. It's, I, I think, um, man. Well, and that's the thing that they don't get. Like, they, I think they think that we have it all figured out. I'm like, no, we're winging it, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. we're yeah. fixing it. We're idea. building uh, this plane while it's flying. Like, yeah. that's right. all you can do. Yeah. Although well, I think kids nowadays probably know better 
they're a little more brighter about that, maybe. Maybe. Then, maybe when they get a little bit older. Do you have kids? Because no, I, I do not. Well, I'm, I think they're, my, at least from my perspective, they don't know. Um, there's a, this entitlement thing, I think, today, where yeah. they think that uh, it should have been a certain way. Not all of them, yeah. but I, yeah. you know, I, I see a lot of it. Uh, and I, I think, to be fair, I probably, I had some views, say, even of my mother when I was younger, about you know, what I thought she should have done or done you know, mm -hmm. differently. And at the end of the day, all you can do is the best uh, that you have right there in front of you right. right now. And they were the right decisions at that time. It'd be based on what you knew. Best you could do. Yep. Right? So yep. you then go on and realize that you, you're still learning. Yep. So let me shift gears a little because yeah. one of the things that I know that is a big part of your life is travel. Mm. And uh, when I talked to a couple of coworkers that we've both had, um, you tend to had well, you're known for having travel woes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is, that, is it true that you actually have that many or are you just everyone knows about those so much more no I have a lot <laughs> and and really it's it's almost everything I do it just comes out more in travel okay for some reason uh, most things I do end up being the hard way mm -hmm. so uh, there's things that go wrong it's been great from a learning perspective because you have to learn to adapt and adjust and improvise etc uh, so I was asked to ask uh -oh. uh, I asked a question yeah uh, they said two words, German made. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can that once you know <laughs> that story's going to come up. Is that one that can be told here? I can't tell you that okay. story. We are on late night, so. Right. Okay. Well, it's not bad, All but right. so uh, we were in Germany. Uh, Who's the we? Uh, some more colleagues. Oh, it was four work. Yes, it was four work. Okay. So we got to Germany. Normally, you know, I don't sleep a whole lot, so I, I never set an alarm. And usually, I handle the time adjustment going to Europe. I'm in Europe quite a bit, mm -hmm. really well. I never have a problem mm -hmm. with it. This particular time, I don't know what was going on, but I set my alarm because I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of sleep. So anything less than four hours, I'm probably going to set an alarm to make sure I get up. Mm -hmm. I set an alarm, there was a bug in the iPhone where the alarm wasn't functioning in certain conditions, so it didn't wake me up. And You found a bug in the iPhone. Well, I didn't. When I did a search afterwards saying, why in the world did my alarm not go off, ah. I could see everybody's report saying, gotcha. there's a problem with mm -hmm. the iPhone, etc. So it, anyway, I didn't wake up when I was supposed to. I woke up to a noise, and I hear- In your room. In my room. It's all dark, I have the shades pulled, everything, and I hear a noise, and I, I wake up and I look, and, and there's this woman in my room, <laughs> right? Wait, what, where had you been the night before? Yeah, like, what, what were yeah, you doing? Right. Yeah. We went out to dinner and, and sat at the bar visiting, et cetera, and then went back to the hotel. So I did not, like a... I did, I did not bring anybody back <laughs> with me to and the hotel. And you hadn't been drinking heavily or something like that? No. So, okay. So I hear a noise and I look, and I see a woman walking in front of my bed, right? Uh -huh. At the foot of my bed. And I sit up and I go, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> right? Yeah. And she turns Not and looks morning. at me and she goes, oh, in German, she starts stalking me, right? <laughs> and I turn on the light and it's the maid. Okay. Okay, so she must have knocked. I didn't yeah. do it. She opens the door, comes in, and uh, didn't turn the light on for whatever reason. Why didn't she turn the light on? I think you need to put the card in the oh, in the okay. thing, and yeah. I don't know if she was going to check. So, uh, who knows, right? <laughs> I don't know. So she, I turn on the light to see her. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Out she goes, and I then look, and I'm like, holy cow, I'm late. I'm not terribly late, but I'm not going to be able to get up, take my time, eat breakfast, etc. Right. So I rush, I get up, I get downstairs, and everybody's waiting for me for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'm a little flustered. I don't like to be rushed in the morning. So we're all standing there, including my boss. And uh, I said, they were giving me grief about being late. I said, you know, it's so confusing. I, I woke up, there's a strange woman in my room. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went on to something else, and I didn't think about the consequence that what, what that might have said to some people. You're so boss or else. later in the day, we were coming back on the train station. Somebody said, you know, I said, well, I, I'm going to get back and get the, to bed. I'm kind of tired. And they said, you know, hopefully, you no know, strange women <laughs> will wake you up in your room. 
And then I realized what that must have right, sounded right. like, right? And of course, to try to clarify it, nobody would believe me. Uh, yeah. Just the, the, the German maid, the strange woman in my room. <laughs> That's classic. Yeah. Uh, so, so Italy is your favorite place. I know this because we've talked about it a lot. So yes. why is that so? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, think I mean, you're Italian. For I, I am Italian. I'm a dual citizen, okay. American and Italian. Uh, I, and so that's no small feat. I mean, the people I, I, you yeah. Yeah. educated me about that. You specifically went out and got your Italian citizenship. I was born an Italian citizen uh, because. Okay, now I'm confused because I thought you said you uh, well, were I'll, born. I'm going to clarify. Okay, for you. I'm going to clarify. I'm going to clarify. You speak Italian. I forgot. The, the uh, my ancestor came to the United States and. Uh, had children here before he became a U.S. citizen. Okay. When he became a U.S. citizen, he had to renounce his Italian citizenship. Because we require that, right? Right. Okay. Up until that point, he was an Italian citizen, and he had kids who were born here. They were born here. They're American. Yeah, right. But they were also Italian. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then later he became an American citizen, uh, but the kids were born American and Italian, and I, uh, my mother was Italian, and uh, as a result, I was Italian. So... I was born Italian, and I went through a process of recognition, officially recognizing my Italian citizenship. With the Italian government? With the Italian government. Okay. So you have to provide a bunch of documents to show your ancestor born in Italy, that they came here, and who was born here, and you have to have all the names right, all the documents, dates, all that correct, submit okay. it, and yep. then they recognize your citizenship. So you now have dual citizenship. I do. I have two but I passports. Thought, how does that work? Because I thought the U.S. said you cannot have dual citizenship. You can have dual citizenship with a few countries. They allow that. But keep in mind, I didn't apply for citizenship. I didn't have to take an right. oath. I was uh, born a citizen. Right. So okay. I'm just as much Italian as I am American mm -hmm. uh, because I'm uh, by juris sanguis, by blood right. Oh. Uh, and you are until death unless you renounce. Correct. Okay. So both my kids are Italian citizens as well. So, uh, one of the things I think about, I've been thinking a lot about the immigration in Europe and the, you know, the legal or illegal immigration in America, and one of the things I think about is that one of the litmus tests that could be used to say whether you're, you're of that nation, like there's people living in France who were born elsewhere, right, mm -hmm. and they're like, they're not really French, the, you know, the, the French are saying they're not really French. One of the litmus tests would be, would you fight for your country, right? So the question comes up, like in this situation, a little far-fetched, but if we were to have a fight where somehow Italy is on the other side, what would you do? Who would you fight for? Or would you abstain? I'm not going to answer that question. The, <laughs> the, what, what I would say is this. Uh, Italy used to have a military uh, service requirement for males up to a certain age. Okay. Uh, they got rid of uh, that requirement, but because I had previously served in the United States military, mm -hmm. I didn't have to meet that requirement anyway. Okay. So, so you kind of you have both the U.S. military uh, service and recognition, and they gave you kind of like you uh, what's that? What do they call that when you test out of a grade or whatever? Well, they'd Did already you? they'd already done away with that requirement. Yeah. But okay. my service, my previous service, so I, I didn't. I started working on that 14 years earlier. Mm -hmm. When I started, I still needed to have the military service, but okay. my military U.S. military service met that requirement. Okay. They wouldn't require me to serve in the Italian military. Well, it took me 14 years to get all the documents right. Right. And over that period of time, they got rid of that requirement. So when I did finally submit my stuff, I didn't have to use my U.S. military service mm -hmm. to get out of compulsory Italian military service. So I, I didn't have to serve. Uh, I would say... That's all good and fine, but you have evaded the actual question, which is, who <laughs> would you fight for? He said he wasn't going to answer. Right? I know. <laughs> right. I did. It depends on what the conflict is. I really? Would, I would reserve... Really? I would reserve my judgment for what made the most sense based on my values and how I saw the particular conflict. Wouldn't you do that with any conflict that we would get into? Well, uh, so, I mean, I think the thing is, obviously, I'm 
I, I believe, too old to be. So the question right. would be, do, would I allow or have or if my you kids were go to school? Right. Well, you know, and the other, the other side of it is, would you have your kids go into mm -hmm. the military or be allowed to be drafted or mm -hmm. moved, you know? And I'd say, yeah, I, I, I would hope that we'd only get into a, a serious conflict where there's a draft that was justifiable, mm -hmm. but I was born in the U.S. and mm -hmm. I, you know, very much feel very strongly about it, and I would have my kids go to that. So I, I think that's a test that anybody should say, is like, if you want to be that country's citizen, would you go to war or would you allow your kids to go to war? I mean, do you think that's a valid, even a valid litmus test? I, I would have to do some more thinking on that. All right, but think on that. a little corollary on that is you realize that there are a lot of illegals. The re you can get an automatic citizenship, and it's been that way all through, going mm -hmm. back to the Civil War. All right. you do is enlist in the army, you become an automatic. When you get out of the uh, military, you're an automatic citizen in the United States. There are mm -hmm. many, there are tens of thousands of of uh, uh, illegals, illegals in our military right now. And when they get out, they they become. I'm not I, sure if they become automatic citizens while they're serving or when they get out, mm -hmm. but it, it's always been that way. Well, so, I, um, yes, I, I don't want to go too far in that, but I, I think that's, a, that's a definitely a conversation so I, I'd like to have. So I, I would say this, that, that, you know, when you think about just because we're married, and I'm very proud and it's why I wanted to serve in the military, yeah, right? right? I, I, I raised my hand, I put, a, I put my life on the line yeah. for what I believe our country stands for. Keep in mind, our country hasn't always done the right thing. Oh, the absolutely. leaders right. that we right. have in place haven't always done the right thing. And we got to where we are, we, the United States, because we stood up and fought against our own country That's at that true. time. Yeah. So yeah. if our country was doing something <clears throat> contrary to our constitutional values and privileges, uh, and somebody asked me to fight on behalf of that in mm -hmm. conflict of the oath that I took previously, I don't think I would. Yeah. So it, it, there's too many unknowns there to figure mm -hmm. out what you would do. But well, so here's one that may also be an unknown. You're you're you are very big into um, ancestry and your mm -hmm. your ancestry, which is all in Italy, right? Because you, both your mother and father were right. Italian. So you've gone very far back. So Roman is known at work as being the guy that really knows uh, Italian history, mm -hmm. working very hard on it. So we were in a meeting one time, and it was uh, quite a few people in the meeting. And Roman is—I wouldn't say Roman is well respected. I wasn't—I mm -hmm. was going to say feared, but you're not feared. But people. I gather that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're in this meeting. There's quite a few people in it, and it's before the meeting started. And I say, uh, hey, Roman, you, you are—you know—you know, you know uh, all of your ancestors are from Italy, right? He said, Yep. And I said, And all the way back, if you go far back, far enough back, th that was the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. And they had slaves back. You know, they, mm -hmm. Romans had slaves, yep. right? You know, people owned each mm -hmm. other. It was actual. He's like, yep. Because I'm half Italian. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what I'm wondering is, like, is it possible that my great, 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 great grandfather and mother on my father's mm -hmm. side, the Italians, could they have owned your family in some way for your great, 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 great? <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Thing? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> All I the ridiculous <laughs> statements I've heard in my life, I remember. <laughs> I got to say, every single person in the room was, like, riveted to hear oh, what was I, about to happen. I am sure. Believe. And Roman's threading a needle trying to figure out, I just want to get a meeting started here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you could have heard a pin drop. And Because uh, I think people didn't know if you were going to, like, dress me down or, or laugh mm -hmm. is what it came down to. Right. And I think, I don't remember exactly. I, at the end of the, what you have? I, I think you said, oh, hell no. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that might have been. Sure. I just didn't think your family was smart enough. <laughs> no. so, uh, but just, that's, it's just a representation <laughs> right. of right. you. Uh, it's a right small now. sample size. Right. We don't Absolutely. really know, you know, pretty far. I will say, it, it, Italy, as we know, it, has only been a country since uh, 1851, mm -hmm. yeah. 1861. So uh, there were all city-states before that, yeah. and they didn't... Uh, um, venture much beyond their, their borders. The Roman Empire did, but okay. uh, they weren't Italians. So mm -hmm. do try to find out, though, if, if either yeah. anyone in my family... My family was much above having slaves. Mm -hmm. so. uh, yeah. Uh, lightning round. <laughs> Every time we do yes. the last few minutes, we're going to do lightning round. Okay. Roman, you don't know this because you no, haven't I don't watched know the this. show or no. anything like that. This is new. So, but you're in it. Okay. Oh, I am. We just fire okay. off some questions you answer them. Uh, Can you pass? No. Okay. What was your high school uh, or childhood nickname? 
I don't think I had one. Seriously? Yeah. Fraulini? They couldn't come up with anything? No. Okay. Nug. Nug? Yep. Is there a backstory? Yeah, there is, because I'm a junior. Oh, you, Norris? My dad's name is Norris. And, and so, uh, so instead of, yeah, the nickname, was instead of, they didn't want to call me Junior. Yeah. It was just a big deal. No, we're not calling him Junior. I don't know about the origins, actually, of the name. I think it goes back to one of the, some, somebody in the family at some point had been mm -hmm. called something. And uh, in fact, it wasn't, if there are still family members, older aunts and uncles, who will occasionally pop the old nug on me, so. Nug. I, I have to remember that. I did mm -hmm. go by the wolf at times. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give yourself a nickname. Uh, I, didn't, an I have the shirt. <laughs> if you just had it here. Right. <laughs> Who's the funniest person you know, and why are they so funny? And we're we're in uh, short time, so we got us. We got a. Well, you are ones. Brian. No, That's no. a quick one for me. <laughs> Thanks. I'll uh, pay you later. The uh, funniest person I know. What is it? I thought you said one time your your uncle. My uncle, one. he makes me laugh a lot, yeah. uh, that's for sure. All right, yeah. all right. You don't get too hardcore about this. <laughs> so I was thinking somebody was telling jokes, you know, oh, kind of, oh, that, that yeah, kind no, of no, thing. That, that you personally know. No, he, uh, he, he said some funny things. Uh, you got to tell really the, funny. the one about the cruise ship. Um, <laughs> you want me to tell yeah, that on your yeah, show, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, my uncle said he was on a cruise, and he, him and his friends were in the bar enjoying some cocktails and an evening out. And, he uh, made his way back to his room at the end of the night, and he was getting settled in. He hears a knock at the door, and he opens the door, and here's these three ladies from the bar all standing there uh, in front of his door naked. Oh. And he said, hey, I don't know what kind of guy you think I am, but one of you is going to have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> I just yeah. So what, earlier when you asked about the role models, right? He's that's a, what I was yeah. getting at. Hey, yeah, that's I had role models. Look. I don't necessarily know that's they were great. Know. What about you? Not me, obviously. Not Dave. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have to edit that out. <laughs> you know, like who makes you laugh? So I hang around with people Love. that have a good, yeah. And uh, I, it's impossible for me to pick because you know how it is. You're out at yeah. a night and you say, God, he was. Just, they're just. I like people who have a good sense of humor. I can yeah. see right away. Roman's a great guy oh, yeah. to hang out with. So. On a scale of 0 to 100. 72. Well, mm -hmm. that might be it. What percent mature are you? Oh, Ooh. my God. <laughs> I'm going to go with 72. <laughs> 72. I'm, I'm staying with it. All right. What do you think? Dana's not going to see this, right? Uh, nope. Okay. Then I'm, uh, yeah, I'm somewhere. I'm se That's average. 70s? 70. Yeah, I'm an average guy. All right. Uh, what do you wear to feel sexy? Mostly Egyptian cotton. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you? Oh, just yeah, some 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 sexy boxers, you know. Sexy set, boxers. Yeah. I, we won't even think about that. <laughs> All right. Well, we That's are a bit disturbing question. Uh, are we out of time, a, or can I have a question? <laughs> you can make it a quick one. So I've never met my father, so I'm going to mm -hmm. ask a question. What is the most important lesson your father has taught each of you? Oh, that's an easy one for me because I've been thinking about it a lot. Like, right. I, I don't know if it's the most important, but it's a very good one. All right, I'll jump in. You yeah, you go ahead. He taught me that uh, if you borrow something, you you have two responsibilities. One is to give it back as soon as you possibly can, mm -hmm. and two, give it back in as good of a quality or better than you got it. So if we would borrow a lawnmower, you clean it up and you fill it with the gas and you get it back to them as soon as you're done mowing the lawn. And I, you know, it's something that I didn't realize it was so important as a kid, but as an adult, I look back and I go, man, that is exactly correct. Yep. So I, I, you know, life changing? No, I don't know, but it was a good one. Norris, you got one? You never give up. Yeah. He was a fighter. It just and no, when you when you're young and you're, he's telling you you know you go you're gonna go join something and you decide after two days you don't want to be a member of it anymore but oh, I told you you're 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 going through this you made the commitment you're going through you keep fighting through it you figure out it figure it out you figure out how to have a good time while you're doing something that you think hey I decided I really didn't want to do it just stay with it that's, that's something every day that's something that that's I just one. think about that's really good, good. Yeah. all right I don't want to cut anybody off but we gotta say thanks uh, we're at the end of our time. First of all, Roman, Norris, I really appreciate you guys coming out. Yeah. I think it was a great conversation. I, I really appreciate you uh, telling a lot of your backstory and getting to learn that. And, and Norris, thanks for helping me uh, navigate these waters. Thank asking you. Asking great questions. This is wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'll uh, say all of the things that we talked about tonight, we put in the show notes, put it on the website, Extraordinary Friends. And uh, thank you very much.